The word ego, unfortunately, has two very different meanings. And it's easy to get the two of them confused. There's the idea of the ego being something really bad. A person who has a very strong ego is one who <coughs> wants everything done his or her way and doesn't really care about other people's opinions, thinks very highly of his or her own opinions, and puts his or her needs ahead of everybody else's. That kind of ego is unhealthy. and causes a lot of misery for a lot of people. There's the other sense of ego, though, which is very important. In fact, it's essential that you have a good, strong ego in the, in the healthy sense. And that's the ego that's the member of the committee that tries to negotiate between your sense of what you should do and what you want to do, so that the shoulds don't get too overpowering. In other words, you don't get so repressed that you have no will of your own. And you, of course you don't want the wants to take over either. And this negotiation requires a lot of skill. Psychologists have traced five skills that are essential for a healthy ego, and they all have their parallels in the Buddha's teaching. There's that misconception that the Buddha taught us to have no self or no ego, or that we're supposed to suppress our ego. But a person without a good ability to negotiate between wants and shoulds is really at the mercy about just about anything. There was a famous Buddhist teacher who used to talk about the bureaucracy of the ego, telling you you should overthrow that bureaucracy. But then you saw what he did with the students, and it was basically to give them no sense of whether what was right or wrong, and so he could take advantage of them. And in the same way, sometimes your sense of shoulds that other people impose on you take over. But let you asking, you know, are these things really good for me? And of course, the, your wants can take over, too, without any regard for right or wrong or consequences. So that's one of the first things that a healthy ego has to deal with, is the consequences of actions and be able to look forward into the future. Seeing that if you act on this or you think this way, what's going to happen down the line? This ability is called anticipation. In the Buddhist teachings, it's called heedfulness, realizing that your actions really do make a difference And what may seem like an innocent train of thought because no one else is involved really can have consequences that harm you in the future and harm other people, too. So a healthy ego is able to see the consequences and take them seriously. And if you have a healthy ego, you can get your desires to listen to you. But that requires more than just anticipation. You have to be able to sublimate, in other words, find an alternative pleasure. If there's something you like to do that's harmful. What do you, can you do instead that you want to do, that you find pleasurable? This is one of the reasons why we meditate, <coughs> to give the mind a sense of well-being that is blameless, that is reliable. In the beginning it's not all that reliable, but you can turn it into a skill. And once it is a skill, then you can tap into it. And you think about the ease and well-being that come. It's just being able to breathe skillfully, breathe with awareness, fill your body with a sense of well-being. Take advantage of whatever sense of well-being is there and learn how to use the breath in order to move it along. In other words, let it develop. Give it some space. Another negotiating skill is altruism. When you remind yourself that your well-being can't depend on the suffering of other people. You have to take their well-being into consideration as well. This, of course, is compassion. There's an interesting series of stories in the canon 
where the Buddha is talking to some young boys. There's one case where they're beating a snake with a stick, another case where they're fishing. And he asked them, do you, do you want happiness in your life? And they said, yes, of course. They said, well, how can you find happiness where you're making other beings suffer? If you really want happiness, let them be happy too. What's ironic is that he gives the same teaching to a king, King Basenity, who is very much like a little boy in a lot of ways, very impulsive. There's that great scene where he's in the palace with his queen, Malika, and he turns to her at a tender moment and says, is there anyone you love more than yourself? And you know what he's thinking. He wants her to say, yes, Majesty, I love you more than I love myself. And then the violins will swell. But the Polycana doesn't have violins in the background. And she says, no, there's nobody I love more than myself, and how about you? And the king's forced to be honest, well, that really there's nobody he loves more than himself. So he goes on to see the, the Buddha and ask him about this. And the Buddha says, yes, you can go over the whole world and never find anybody who loves you more than they love themselves. You'd never find anybody you love more than you love yourself. That sounds like a dog-eat-dog -dog world, but the Buddha's comment is, because of this, never harm anyone. In other words, if your well-being depends on theirs, their suffering, one, it's not fair, and two, it's not wise. It's not going to last very long. When you find that you have certain desires that are going to harm other people, you've got to remind yourself you can't let your well-being depend on their harm. That's another way of negotiating with your desires. And also negotiating with some of the shoulds that are imposed on you by the world. Because many of us grow up with all kinds of weird ideas of what we have to do or what should be done. And they require a, a lot of suffering on somebody's part. So it's good to be able to reflect on that. One of the obvious examples we see are people who are taught that they have to sacrifice things, to sacrifice living beings in order to gain happiness. But there are a lot more subtle ways in which we do that. So we have to learn how to negotiate, both with that warped sense of what you should do and with the desires that are basically warped, too. And then there's suppression. Now, this is not repression. Repression is when you deny that you have a certain desire, even though it's there. Suppression is when you know that it's there, admit that it's there, but you have to say no. And again, you have to have some skill in saying no. This is where the sense of altruism comes in, when you realize, okay, it would help other people if I resisted this impulse. It would help me if I resisted this impulse, because after all, compassion is not just for others, it's for yourself. Heedfulness. And finally, a sense of humor. You can learn how to laugh at some of your defilements. It takes a lot of their power away. It kind of doesn't talk a lot about humor, but there's a lot of it there. I certainly noticed with the Forrester Johns, they had really good senses of humor. And what this implies is the ability to step back and not take all your desires so seriously to realize that you have some pretty wrong-headed notions of what's going to lead to happiness. And if you can step back and look at them and take a realistic look and see the humor in the situation, I mean, you realize that this is the human condition. When you study history, you have to have a strong sense of irony. Because you see people doing things that they want very much, and of course they end up creating the precise of the things they don't want as a result. And the 
one hand you can see that as sad, on the other hand you can see it, it's pretty dumb. And as I say in ancient Greece, the gods laugh. The gods are up there in heaven looking at human beings, and they get to laugh at our foibles. Well, you become a godlike person, but you can step back and look at your own foibles and laugh at them as well. So all these are negotiating strategies. This is what a healthy ego means. It's, it's a function. It's not a thing in the mind. But it's a range of skills that you need to develop in order to negotiate all the different members of the committee inside and all the voices coming in from outside. Because if this kind of ego is not healthy, then as I said, you're, you're prey to all kinds of stuff, both from people outside and from your strange ideas of what you should and shouldn't do inside and your strange ideas of what you want to do. I mean, a lot of this comes down to seeing that if you really look at what you want to do and look at the consequences, look at the whole story, you realize it's not something you want. So how do you say no? Well, this ability to sublimate, to find a pleasure, and the pleasures that come not only from concentration but come from understanding, the pleasures that come from virtue, that come from generosity, the pleasure that comes from some, doing something noble with your life. You want to nurture this sense of pleasure and the sensitivity to this kind of pleasure. Because when we talk about happiness, it's not just about people running around smiling all the time and being kind of dumb and happy. Whatever gives you real satisfaction in life, you want it to be harmless, you want it to be true, you want it to be reliable. And there's a nobility in finding a happiness. It's Harmless makes use of your capabilities, so you really can act on your compassion. It's not just an idea that it's, it's actually something that you use to determine how you act, how you speak, how you think. You want your heatfulness to be working together with your compassion. After all, that's how heatfulness works. Are you really concerned for? Your well-being, do you really not want to suffer? Do you have compassion for yourself? Okay, be heedful. Learn how to say no to your unskillful desires and your unskillful ideas of what you should and shouldn't do. Learn how to step back from them and regard them with some humor. These functions all come together, and they're all useful as you meditate. You'll find as thoughts come up and get obsessive. You need to be able to step back from the, the loop of the obsession. And these healthy ego functions are precisely the tools that you need. If you've seen people who are good at negotiating, you realize they have to have a sense of humor. They have to have compassion for the people they're working with. Well, have the same sense of humor and compassion for yourself, because the good effects will spread all around. And when you have the healthy kind of ego, then the bad kind of ego gets declawed, defanged, and is no longer such a problem.